Wonderful. Thank you all so very much for joining us. Today's webinar is Land Acknowledgement 2.0. My name is Ryan Coons, and I'm the Folk Life Specialist at the Maryland State Arts Council. Again, it's I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what your experience is on your end of Google Meet, but um, on our end, whenever somebody comes into the meeting, I hear a little doorbell, and it's such a wonderful sound to hear that so many people are so excited to join us today. Uh, we're getting a record number of people. This is this is very encouraging. A little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this is an overview of Google Meet, the communication platform we are using today. Uh, in the past day or so, Google Meet has changed into a slightly new visual layout. Uh, so some of you might be seeing something that looks like what you see on the screen here in the slideshow. Some of you might be seeing something a little different. Same bells and whistles, slightly rearranged. For your information, because we are recording today's webinar, uh, please be sure that if you are not actively speaking in any given moment, to please mute yourself using the microphone button. In both the legacy and the new version of Google Meet, that microphone button is located in basically the same location. One other thing, um, we will be having a question and answer session at the end of today's webinar. And between now and then, please feel invited to ask any questions uh, in the chat. Please be aware the chat is a public chat. Uh, some platforms, of course, allow you to communicate between individuals privately. That is not something available through Google Meet. Um, and for folks using the legacy account, the chat is up here in the upper right-hand corner. And for folks using the new layout, it's somewhere down in the bottom right-hand corner. We like to start all public meetings of the Maryland State Arts Council with a series of grounding documents, beginning with this video that was made at the height of the pandemic. And as people increasingly get vaccinated and as things start to change their open status, this becomes ever more pertinent. So without further ado, the arts are waiting for you. We are still here. We're dancing and designing. We're sculpting and singing. We're reading and writing. We're painting and playing. We're creating. We are Maryland artists and we are ready and waiting. As I said, we like to begin all meetings with the Maryland State Arts Council with a series of grounding documents to introduce ourselves and our mission to you, our audience, and our constituents. Following the best practices of accessibility, I will read these aloud. MSCC's equity and justice statement. The arts celebrate our state's diversity, connect our shared humanity, and transform individuals and communities. The MSAC and its supporting collaborators are committed to advancing and modeling equity, diversity, accessibility, and inclusion in all aspects of our organizations and across communities of our state. MSAC and its grantees are committed to embracing equity and non-discrimination, regardless of race, religious creed, color, age, gender expression, sexual orientation, class, language, and or ability. Our vision, MSAC plays an essential role in ensuring every person has access to the transformative power of the arts. And our mission, MSAC advances the arts in our state by providing leadership that champions creative expression, diverse programming, equitable access, lifelong learning, and the arts as a celebrated contributor to the quality of life for all the people of Maryland. MSAC has five strategic goals. They are to increase participation, to provide intentional support, to build capacity, to leverage connections, and to bolster Maryland arts. And today we invite you to participate using this series of creative meeting actions and to add to this list actions of your choice. They are to celebrate being in the space with other creative people, to engage with everyone's presence as a gift, to acknowledge that together we know a lot, to enter the conversation with curiosity and inquiry, to share your idea and trust that it will be heard, to use I statements such as I think or I feel or I believe, to focus your language on the task at hand, to hold one another accountable with care, to apply yes and, as in, I hear your idea and I'm going to add to it, and to balance speaking and listening. Today's webinar is part of a series of professional development opportunities available through MSAC. Uh, and I'd like to draw your attention especially to the weekly, every Tuesday morning, Coffee with Ken. This is a space held by our executive director 
for any and all members of the Maryland arts community to find as broadly as possible for peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So please feel invited to share your ideas, your criticisms, your recommendations, your ideas, your struggles, your joys, your successes. And for more information on this and many other professional development opportunities, please feel invited to check out our website at msac.org. Today's webinar is Land Acknowledgement 2.0, and it is a companion webinar to one we presented in November 2020, entitled Land Acknowledgement in Context. This webinar is available uh, publicly on our YouTube channel, and we'll drop the link to that in the chat here momentarily. This Today's webinar, uh, I'm quite, quite, quite excited about we've been looking forward to this for a very long time and we are joined today by uh, eight participants who you see listed on the slide here and I'd like to start off by asking them to introduce themselves. These introductions are in alphabetical order by last name and so I will start out by asking uh, I'll name each of you and as you hear your name please provide a brief introduction. Chief Donna Abbott. Good afternoon, I'm Chief Donna Abbott with the Nassau Waywash Band of Indians, and we are based on the eastern shore of Maryland in Dorchester County. Thank you very much, Chief Donna. Tom Bradshaw? Find the buttons to click here. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Tom Bradshaw. Right now, I am an honorary member of the Nassau Waywash. Um, I'm a local historian and genealogist, and I am working on tracing my roots back to some of the bloodlines that the uh, tribe recognizes, and glad to be here uh, with everyone this afternoon. Thank you very much. Buddy Howard? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Norris Howard Jr., otherwise known as Buddy Howard. Um, Wingapo, uh, other, that is in our language, the word hello. Um, I am a council member of the Pocomoke Indian Nation and a tradition bearer and the current secretary of the Pocomoke Indian Nation. Pocomoke Indian Nation is defined by oral history, documents, and other research. The traditional tribal homelands of the Pocomoke Paramountcy include the territory of the principal nation Pocomoke and the territories of the Anamesic, Gingatig, Minokin, Marumsko, Naswadix, and Quindaqua peoples, covering a northern part of Accomack County, Virginia, all of present-day Somerset County, Maryland, most of Worcester County, Maryland, a part of eastern Wicomico County, Maryland, and a southern part of Sussex County, Delaware. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chief Howard. Chief Howard, did we lose you? Well, while Chief Howard is figuring out the technology, uh, which has been a problem for myself today, I confess as well, we will move on. Chief Howard, when your tech works again, please do let me know and we'll come back to you. Uh, Jess McPherson. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here today. My name is Jess McPherson. I am a Susquehanna Indian. My family are Shawnee. Um, I am a social impact strategist, an artist, and um, a member of the Circle Legacy Center, uh, where I chair the Longhouse Educational Oversight Committee. Um, and I currently serve Maryland as the finance director for Native American Lifelines, the uh, area's urban Indian health program. Thank you very much. Chief Quiet Bear. Halcola, good afternoon. My name is Chief Quiet Bear. I'm chief of the Assateague. Indian tribe of Delaware, Maryland, Virginia. Uh, my tribe focuses on teaching our history, our language, and our culture, as long as uh, traditions that we have been passed down from generation to generation. Uh, I'm glad I'm here today along with the other tribal leaders and hope to have a nice conversation with anyone who's interested in asking some questions today. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Elise Myers Hall. Oh, Chief Howard, you're back. Wonderful. We'll go back to you. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, <laughs> good day. Um, I'm Norris Howard, Chief of the Pokemon Paramountcy. Prehistoric and historic villages and territories lie along the rivers of Little and Great Anamasic, Minokin, and Pokemo, and the coastal Bay of Chincote. Let me take this opportunity to thank Brian Coons and the folks at NSAC for producing this land acknowledgement project. Our hope is this undertaking will enhance the public knowledge by presenting a true chronicle of our first people. Now, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Elise Myers Hall, are you here? I'm here. You are here, and I missed seeing you. Welcome, and please introduce yourself. Yes, good afternoon, all my relations. Um, my name is Elise Myers Hall. Most people call me Allie. I am Lenape citizen and Shawnee Susquehanna descendant, all from Pennsylvania. I am an educator and an artist. I am serving as the president of the American Indian Society. And I am honored to be with all of you today. And I just feel like this is a day of just unity. It's good to see you all. Thank you so much. And last and certainly not least, Rico Newman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, glad to see you all here. It's a great day. Uh, my name is Rico Newman. I'm a member of the Choptico Band of the people who live where waters blend below the rapids. And I try to be retired. Thank you, sir. And I note the uh, choice of your word, try to be retired. <laughs> Thank you all so very much for joining us. Uh, it's a genuine pleasure to host you all here, and I'm very excited for today's conversation. Before we get to the uh, main meat of our conversation, if I can so call it, I'd like to provide you a brief overview of both what land acknowledgement statements are and where this particular webinar came from. So very briefly, as I mentioned, today's webinar is a companion webinar to one presented by Maryland Traditions, the traditional arts program of the Maryland State Arts Council, back in November 2020. You can access it uh, via YouTube. At, it's uh, entitled Land Acknowledgement in Context. And there, and what I'm going to do right now, is just briefly encapsulate what land acknowledgement statements are provide a bit of a foundation. These are statements that recognize the indigenous people or peoples who have been dispossessed from their land or lands in a very local context. Land acknowledgement statements can be read aloud before an event, placed in program notes, put on plaques inside institutions, published inside on, on institutional and personal web sites. Um, they're very flexible. And they begin to center indigenous history, experiences, and realities and as such, given the um, massive history of indigenous erasure that is endemic to the Mid-Atlantic, land acknowledgement statements become something of a very useful educational tool. And uh, they are work that is appropriate for those of us who are not indigenous, such as myself, that really function as the most basic courtesy that we can do as uninvited visitors on indigenous land. Now, of course, land acknowledgements have been very correctly critiqued as being merely or often only lip service, only performative. And reacting to this very valid critique, I and my colleagues at the Maryland State Arts Council created uh, an ongoing MSAC land acknowledgement project. It's now more than a year old. Uh, we're reaching a couple of very important milestones, this webinar being one of them. And um, within the context of this project, we have been very fortunate to consult with tribes whose lands are claimed by Maryland. Um, these consultations have been recorded. They will eventually be available through the Maryland Traditions Archives, which of course are housed at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC, in their Department of Special Collections. And these compensated consultations have allowed us both to develop relationships with indigenous peoples, learn what they want us to know about their tribal history, realities, experiences. And these consultations and the materials we have learned uh, and gathered during them will very shortly 
be turned into publicly accessible resources on land acknowledgement featuring tribal information. I'm actually working on that this week. And of course, state government always moves very slowly, but we're hoping that this publicly accessible resource will be available on our website, mscc.org, by the end of this calendar year, 2021. So again, coming out of these conversations and reacting to the critique that land acknowledgement statements are very uh, performative, they're reductive, they're really, again, barely a basic courtesy, but also a beginning. And reacting to that, uh, we put together today's webinar in order to create a space in which our participants, who just introduced themselves, can share with you, our audience, their ideas of ways we, non-Indigenous people performing land acknowledgements, can move beyond the performative aspects of them to begin facilitating positive change led by Indigenous peoples. So without further ado, I'm going to ask our participants, uh, as we had discussed during our planning meeting, if, as you wish to speak to please use the raised hand function located in the bottom center, or if you're using the legacy version, the bottom right-hand corner of Google Meet, and we'll use it as kind of a digital talking stick, and I will facilitate conversation. So let's begin. Yes, buddy. Um, I, I'd like to just say that from, from my perspective, I think the, the idea of the land acknowledgement in Maryland especially uh, is important because <clears throat> so much of the history of Maryland as it applies to indigenous peoples uh, has, for, for lack of a better word, uh, been lost. Uh, been lost to the to the public. Um, in in our area on the Lower Eastern Shore, that live here that have really no understanding of the indigenous connections uh, to the places that they live, and I think that. More about who remains and and how those people. Um, can uh, express themselves and, and interact with the public and teach the public uh, the, the life ways of the indigenous peoples and the history of the indigenous peoples. Um, you know, we learn a lot about Western tribes and rightfully so uh, in, in generalized education, but um, we, we learn very little about local tribes and uh, the local history. And I think that's, I think this is a good nexus to begin that conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, buddy. And participants, do please, do please feel invited to um, speak to the points that we have on the uh, screen here that we've put together, as you prefer, or at, to add to it. Ryan, I believe we had a hand up from Rico, uh, and then Kibibi, and then Ali, it looks like. Wonderful. Rico. Okay, uh, we'll try then to uh, give some relationship about land acknowledgement, uh, something I've expressed before that uh, we have to take in consideration when we start acknowledging this land. It's something that everyone who's ever looked at a history book from third grade on knows uh, whose land uh, they're on, basically. Um, but I generally hesitate uh, with people to not think of it in current terms where you think in um, boundaries. Uh, we did not do surveys of land, um, and we certainly did not look at land in terms of ownership. We lived there, we survived there, we produced our foods there, we hunted. We had relationships and we practiced our traditions and our cultures there. And um, within that context, and that is our territory. It's the, depending on what the symbiotic or equitable relationships would be between the different towns, villages, if you will, uh, where they would be stretched out and where they had a ongoing relationship with one another. Uh, that would encompass, if you will, um, traditional territory. Uh, and I use the word territory loosely. 
Um, and I'm not speaking of the impact that uh, colonialism had where we were forced into the areas of others because everyone knows that the Piscataway moved about um, like who would have thought it anywhere from Pennsylvania all the way up to New York uh, and on out to the Midwest, the old Northwest, I should say. So you have to take those things into consideration. Uh, the, the other thing I'd like to say when you start talking about land acknowledgement, always speak that it's something that others should be doing, not us. We know it's those who have different ideas uh, as to whose land this is, uh, now claiming it as mother country, et cetera, that need to uh, be the ones that take the land acknowledgement uh, into consideration as to uh, where they are, whose land they're on. Uh, it, it behooves me to be asked to go somewhere and to give a land acknowledgement to somebody. Uh, when I think that, that they should do their homework and uh, acknowledge that uh, in my presence, not the other way around. But I think that we're on a good path with uh, starting with the uh, land acknowledgement that certainly uh, falls into some of the things that we see happening today when people talk about um, inclusion and equity. Uh, these things need to be fleshed out and uh, th that can be done in this process of um, land acknowledgement. So, Thank you, Rico. Uh, Chief Howard, I see your hand. Um, Elise has a hand up just before you, if you don't mind, so we'll just go in that order. Elise, did you want to add something now? No, I mean, I did, but I would prefer for Chief Howard to go first. Thank you. Chief Howard. Uh, yes. Um, I know Ari, uh, I know Rico well enough to be able to uh, <laughs> say I can't hear him. And uh, I don't know if that can be corrected or not, but I would love to be able to hear what he had to say. And I don't think it, I don't think anyone else had the same problem, but I couldn't hear it. Rico, you are a little quiet. I can hear you a little bit with difficulty. Um, can you get closer to your microphone? It might just be a proximity issue. Uh, yeah, I can uh, recap very briefly. Uh, I'm saying that most of us uh, that know our history uh, know where our, our communities are, that uh, we generally uh, had symbiotic relationships with one another. Uh, and those outside of that uh, relationship, uh, that equ equitable relationship that we have with each other, um, whatever created that, that unity, that, that center, when you get beyond that, then you're outside, I guess, what most, most people would call your territory. And I speak in a difference of where we were and who we were prior to colonialism because so many of us were forced out of our traditional uh, places and into other places because of encroachments, uh, warfare, and uh, all other kinds of drama that was going on once the colonialism began. So yeah, I look at those two things differently, who we were prior to and what happened afterwards that caused us to uh, pretty much um, spread out into other areas that we weren't traditionally in. Thank you, sir. Elise? Uh, Ryan, excuse me, but somebody said that they were after um, Rico, and I just wanted to make sure we keep in order. Well, this is something that I can ask uh, all your participants, um, your preferences. We had, the, we have the option of asking audience members to hold their questions for the end and at the moment just have a eight person uh, conversation. Or as you prefer, I have no preferences here that audience members can ask their questions now and we can discuss them as we go. Uh, what say ye? Well, with that being said, I'm going to piggyback off of what uh, Rico said to um, when we speak about the land, the, the terra firma, the land itself, there's so much history involved in that and I had said before when I shared about the, uh, the voices and to what we're doing right now, it seems like it might be a slow start, but what I see is a steady pace. And as we go about, we start pulling out truths, especially while we still have some of our elders here who can really enlighten us. You know, 
Um, I'm not from Maryland, of course, but the Susquehannock and um, the Pocomo, all of this runs through what we call our lands. So I think that as we understand that we did not have um, Maryland divided, Pennsylvania divided to Virginia. It was just land. And that's one of the things that we're going to have to run into is the division of what they're calling um, land now. Thank you very much. Um, I see, uh, I'm seeing them in alphabetical order, so I'm not quite sure of the order. But before we move on to the next thing, um, participants, which would you prefer, that audience members ask their questions as they occur, or shall we wait for the Q&A at the end? I believe you should wait for the Q&A because of your time. You have to be careful with your time, and I don't want to interfere with that. Thank you, Elise. Anyone else have any other opinions? I think you should hold till the end because we're almost halfway through the hour now. That That's my preference too. So um, audience members, we're thrilled that you have these questions. Um, please place them into the chat. I'm collecting them as you place them there. And possibly your questions might be answered between now and the last 10 minutes. And if not, we will get to your questions there. So thank you very much. Um, I believe Chief Quiet Bear, your hand is the next one that I see, and then Jess. Hi, I just like I agree with Rico, and I just like to add on to that that this entire state of Maryland were indigenous lands. The boundaries that were created when Maryland was formed caused a great separation. We had trading places that we went to. Each tribe had areas that they worked through and lived on, and we did not have the concept of owning the land. We were just there to use it during our lifetime, and it passed on generation to generation. We don't have physical things that we take with us when we pass. The things we need to pass down are the knowledge and teachings of our each individual tribe. That's all I have to say right now. Thank you, sir. Jess. Yeah, um, to, to sort of pick up um, Elise and um, Mike's points, understanding contemporary political boundaries, it, it, like they don't overlap and the concepts don't overlap. Um, but also I think, um, one of the things that we do with land acknowledgements is talk about who was here when colonists arrived. And we don't talk about the continuum of life, as, as um, Mike is, is alluding to, the continuum of, of indigenous life in this space. And so as we think about that, as we think about, uh, you know, I, I was uh, honored to be able to sort of consult and represent on our Susquehannock ancestors behalf, but you know, as we think about that space of Baltimore County and Howard County and Cecil County, if, as we acknowledge it as Susquehannock uh, land, um, we shouldn't forget all of the tribes and all of the people that came through, that, that shared this space with us and that share this space with us today. As non-Native people, I think that's really important and one of the you know, most important and very basic uh, points of advocacy that you can do. Just understand Native people live with you right now. Right now, at your job, at your, you know, at your school, at your grocery store, at your urban Indian health facility, at the powwow you went to last weekend, all of those places. Thank you, Jess. Elise, you wanted to add to that? No, I didn't know I had raised my hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's quite all right. Um, just had you finished. I hope I didn't interrupt you. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's the point that I want to make. But I think um, I, I can I can go on to the further point. There is sort of one of 
uh, those relationships, relationships with the people around you, but then also kind of understanding your occupation of this space as a thing that puts it out of balance with its original intent, with its original purpose, with its original being. Um, and then, you know, how do you begin to think about rectifying that, about healing that those relationships with space and life and all of those people around you. And I, I hope that that's a tool that land acknowledgements can, um, that, you know, that can be a sort of next step, a next thought in the process. Jess, this might be a good opportunity um, for those of you joining us from the audience. Um, in preparation for today's webinar, the nine of us got together to discuss various options, as you see some of them here on the screen in the slideshow. And Jess, uh, you had brought up the last bullet point there, um, not just being aware of the Native peoples who are living around and with and working with and interacting with us on a daily basis, but also the idea that um, there are the other than humans involved. Uh, would you care to speak to that at this point? Sure. Um, I think that the sort of more Western way of thinking about things is to think about land and life in it as something that should be dominated, that are resources for you to consume. And, you know, indigenous perspectives tend toward understanding it not as an inanimate thing, but as an animate thing as a thing that, you know, as, as all things having spirit and life and um, uh, ourselves having responsibilities to those things and, and that reciprocal nature of those responsibilities to, to uh, all of us. Thank you very much. Other participants, other things you want to speak to or add or bring up new points? Uh, buddy, yes. Um, well, I'd just like to reiterate my comment at the beginning and and how it dovetails into this discussion uh, from from the others. Um, the more the public understands who we were when um, at contact and and what the eastern shore uh, and for that matter, the entire state of Maryland was like uh, at contact, the more that they can appreciate where how far we've come from that and uh i think that um whether it's an environmental interest or whether it's a history interest or uh, um, an interest in in uh indigenous peoples generally uh, I, I think that this can be a launching pad this land acknowledgement because you know be before uh we can delve into these other areas uh we we first need to educate the public as to who we who we are and and where we were um, at contact with Europeans. Um, from there, you know, we can we can delve into all of these other tangents, all of which are equally important, uh, whether it's culture or uh, industry or uh, environment, uh, and you know broaden that conversation but i think you know everything that's been said thus far has has touched on these various different areas of interest uh, that the public will have um, but they 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 really need to first understand who we who we are um, and and go from there so just wanted to touch base on that thank you thank you very much uh Elise, i think i saw your hand and then jess and then she's quite there okay thank you i wanted to add on to what uh, jess was saying and the rest uh, as an educator and we believe that children are our hope children the seventh generation are our light so what i do along with an elder we are teaching the children is called give back and what that means is to respect for nature this is not yours to take but to use to give back. So the children will bring in seeds from whichever meal they have had. And we plant those and we nurture them and they watch it grow. And it's, it's their relationship with growth, the roots and the growth and what you have done. And they do not get to keep what they grow. They can only share. 
So it begins with just your, your, your little tax deductions, the ones who are thought of often the least. That's where you're going to, in my opinion, that's where you're going to begin to change the concept of land, land acknowledgement because we're not going to be able to go back and decolonize or anything like that, but we can go forward and educate and share, and you would be surprised uh, I'm what these children this webinar. do. So anytime after that, uh, I'm supposed to be in Eastern Boston. That's it. Thank you very much, Elise. Uh, let's see, Jess, I think you put your hand down. Um, Chief Quiet Bear, I believe you were next, and then Rico, and then Chief Donna. I'm hearing a lot of good conversation and a lot of good points being made, but there's something that people don't really know about us. And we basically live in two worlds. We live in our native world, trying to keep our traditions, but we have to go out and earn a living and, and do other things. And a lot of times there's a conflict with our religious beliefs and some of the things that you're asked to do at work or you may have a conflict with your neighbor. I'll, I'll give you an example. I was growing tobacco in my backyard and my neighbor says, what kind of plant is that? And I said, that's tobacco. She says, oh, do you roll cigarettes and smoke it? And I told her no, that that was sacred tobacco and that it's used for ceremonies and that if I need a cigarette, I'll just go to the store and buy a pack of cigarettes. So. It's our responsibility to engage with people outside and let them know what we're about, where we come from, and where we'd like to go in the future. And this land acknowledgement is greatly helping with that, and I appreciate it. And I, and I do support all the other comments I've heard today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rico, I believe your hand is next, and then Chief Donna. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, when I speak with groups, I have to remind them that um, I'm here alive in the 21st century. So when I start looking in the rearview mirror of our history, uh, I have to look to others who have uh, done the deep dive into the available documentation, others that can look at, uh, like anthropologists that can look at uh, material culture and start deciphering. Uh, some meaning from those things. And I read those and, and uh, I, I do take them uh, into consideration, but uh, I don't swallow the whole cloth um, because there, there's a, such a diversity of opinion out there about what material culture means and represents. But there are you know, some recent things that have come out that I would recommend people who want to uh, get some grasp of uh, some of the culture um, one recent uh, uh, book out there was the um, Braiding Sweetgrass, which, which I recommend that uh, everybody get their hands on and, and read that one. Uh, another one that just came out, I listened to this lady on National Public Radio speaking about her experience in the forest, dealing with the trees and, and all that's the interconnected and related to it. And she produced a book called The Mother Tree. Another one I would suggest, uh, it's a little wordy, uh, but if you get through it and get the meat of it, you can get some understanding that uh, our relatives, the one-legged, uh, the, the plants, the, the mushrooms and everything else, they have an, a, an imbibing relationship the same way that we did with one another. And of course, their relationship has changed. And uh, in reading through that, you find out that uh, that side of nature has been impacted by um, commercialism. I would say commercialism, but it doesn't necessarily have to be capitalism. But uh, it's about uh, what came here and what changed our relationship with our fellow travelers on this planet. Someone spoke earlier about our relationship with other animals. Um, we didn't see ourselves as being superior uh, to any other animal. I mean, because uh, I challenge anybody to take their, their, even with their hands, let me see you build a bird's nest. Uh, so animals have talents and abilities that are beyond us, uh, even with our technology. Um, the animals meant so much to us in the hand that uh, most of us, uh, uh, our clans or our family names were based upon different animals. And, and those attributes that those animals represented is what attracted us uh, to them. Because these animals have talents that we don't have. 
we think ourselves a little above them because uh, it was indoctrinated in me very early that, hey, man was made in the image and likeness of God. You know, but how? Um, how different are we from uh, any of the other animals? Um, so I think we need to take those things into consideration and uh, to uh, read as much and as often as you can, make up your own mind at the end of the day as to, to what you ingest from other authors. Um, they're not always correct and they're not always wrong, but uh, it's up to the individual to sort through it. Uh, if you go as far back as reading about Rachel Carson and what she predicted what was going to happen, what we were doing with our environment, especially the water. Um, and you can see these things uh, transpiring and take, taking place today. But um, I think one of the best documented evidence that it was a novel that I read, it was called The Ruins of Cash. And it talked about a well-disciplined, organized society that um, interacted, that didn't have money and, and that type of thing going on. And uh, they rescued a young man from sea. He was about to drown. They didn't know who he was or where he came from. And just that introduction of that one element, that young man in, into their society, created change that was, for them, chaos. But again, um, Change happens, we, we need to look back in that rear view mirror, as I said, to see what was, what is, and decide for ourselves, you know, uh, what we're going to make our priorities in life, what our value systems are going to be. And uh, understand that our fellow travelers on this planet have a right to be here and a right to their life just as we do. Thank you. Thank you, Rico. Uh, Chief Donna. I am so impressed with everyone today and thank you for all the input. I wanted to touch base, uh, go back to the uh, educating people part. Um, I agree that we definitely need to um, get, it, get our history out there and, and educate the people in our own communities as to what we are and what we're all about. I have um, been invited by a couple of the small local private schools to come in on a Wednesday afternoon six period to uh, give a little presentation on our history. Um, however, I had to alter my presentation as to not tread on the Christian beliefs and the Ten Commandments. So um, I think there's just enough people out there to be intrigued about our history, but yet they don't want to know enough to appreciate it. And I'm not sure where all of this can be rectified. Yes, I think a good place to start is in elementary schools, but that's not where it stops either. I think the education needs to be carried on into the high school levels and even our local community colleges. Um, I know as a former commissioner on the MCIA, and Rico can uh, confirm this, that they had committees that were working with some of the local educational institutions on allowing the graduates to wear a type of indigenous adornment with their graduation cap and gown um, and it was a struggle it really was and I, I'm not sure how to fix all of that it just seems like it's an ongoing problem but yet the longer we wait the harder it is gonna it's gonna be to fix so um, I, I don't know that's just my opinion on all of that but uh, I, it is definitely an ongoing problem that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Donna. Um, Tom Bradshaw. Yeah, the education is key to putting our history out there. Um, I drove a school bus for almost 10 years, and being a local historian, you know, I would have the teachers at the end of the year, you know, when they didn't have anything else to do, um, come in and ask me to come in and give a talk about our local history. 
And, you know, I would touch on our native history as well. But the thing of it is, um, the curriculum of today is not what it was when I was in elementary and even high school. They gear it towards teaching for to the test. All they do is test, 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 test. And, you know, in, draw, in listening to the kids on the bus, you know, during that week of testing, you know, these kids were so upset and nervous that they were going to disappoint their teachers by having low scores, you know, I felt so bad for them. I didn't know what to do. And, you know, it's like uh, when the reservations, yeah, we had them here in Maryland, but, you know, these kids, they didn't understand when I said that, you know, they're thinking Oklahoma and places like that. No, they started here in the East where the first, settlers came and you know we were relegated to certain areas of land within the state um they also didn't realize that you know with the seasons our ancestors moved you know we went with that time of year in the spring and summer we were farming in the winter time you know we were more inland uh hunting game looking for shelter from the cold you know things like that and to get the boards of education interested in furthering that curriculum, it's almost like pulling IT. I mean, I'm dealing, my boss and I are sort of dealing with something like that um, in the forest service to have a forestry curriculum uh, introduced into the uh, career and technology training centers of our high schools. And you're almost at loggerheads with them. So it, I'm, I'm, you know, that's where it needs to start. We need to put focus on getting these boards of education to acknowledge that they need to teach this history and not with such a broad brush. Thank you very Thank you. much. And uh, Jess, uh, if this, I think yours is the last hand I see. If I think this will be the last comment before we move into the question and answer session. I just wanna say, um, Thanks, Donna, for bringing up the point that uh, people want to learn and they want to be educated, but they only want to learn and educate so much. Like they're not interested in investing in, in doing the, the real heavy work. And um, I appreciate all levels of interest in doing some of this work because it is heavy and we've been carrying it for a very long time. So it's important to know that land acknowledgements, that learning about the people uh, wherever you're from, learning about the indigenous people there, you know, trying to think about what your next steps are going forward. None of that is tidy. It's not going to be neat. It's not going to be easy. You have to step in and start doing something. You can't do it all at once. You have to take a step. Thank you all so very much. This is, as I said at the onset of the webinar, this has been um, a webinar I've been looking forward to for a very long time. And the discussion, both by the participants, thank you very much for speaking orally, and to those of you in the audience who are speaking in the chat, I'd like to, trans to transition to a question and answer session. As I mentioned, I have been uh, gathering your questions in the chat, and some of them speak to very similar things, so we won't be getting, obviously, to every single one of them. Ooh, computer. Uh, but we will be speaking, I think, to a lot of these. And I'd like to begin with something that Kibibi Ajanku brought in. Uh, she says, quote, the continuum of indigenous life post-colonization intersects with enslaved Africans who were stolen to build and farm the land. Land acknowledgements must be rectified and expanded. And Kathy O'Dell responds to that with a plus one and saying, quote, I always feel the urge when acknowledging those whose land was stolen to include those who were stolen from their land, all for the purposes of colonizers' profit. My question, am I showing respect for the former by expanding a land acknowledgement to include the latter, or am I disrespecting the latter by excluding them from a land acknowledgement? And Kibibi, is there anything you'd care to add to this before we open it to our participants to um, respond? It looks like she left the meeting. She might be having some Wi-Fi issues. I didn't. I... Oh, okay. No, there you are. Hi. I'm, 
Can you hear me? I don't know what just happened. We Such can hear you. Sometimes Google Meet throws a wobbly. Uh, was there anything that you wanted to add to what I just said, to what you, uh, I quoted your quote in the chat? Was there anything you wanted to add to that? You, you quoted it quite nicely. And I, I responded to Kathy by saying that it, it saddens me that I, I, I like her, her, her inquiry, but it saddens me that we feel the need, that we've become so separate, that we feel the need to ask that question and in, in an effort to honor. And I say that because... I am the great, great, great granddaughter of a woman who on her deathbed said to her family, uh, um, my husband was a Native American, but he passed as black so that he would not be stripped from his family with 10 children and be reposi repositioned in faraway land. Um, so he past as a black man and we are just finding this out generations later so there is so much more um information to be held to be known about to be uh, um nurtured about the way uh black people have intersected with native people with indigenous people and we are once again in this land acknowledges uh, Brian you considered yourself an uninvited visitor are, are you know we're not in that category of uninvited visitors we are we're stolen and trafficked so uh, you know I am just wanting at some point in this America to be home to, you know to to be a part of really whole statements that truly honor um people of power, right? People of worth, people of intelligence, people of, of dignity, and people of, of great talent and artistry. And I, you know, um, so there's that. That's what I would add to it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kabibi. Um, I saw several hands from participants. Was there any anyone who wanted to speak to Kabibi's comments? Chief I Biden. did. Uh, Khabibi, uh, I'm glad that you found out you have Native blood. Native American tribes have always, always accepted African Americans into their fold. I myself have people in my tribe of African descent and Native descent. Your history is our history. It's intertwined. We have been together. There have been people who have tried to pass as black rather than Indian. I know exactly what you're talking about. And I support you 100%. And I think the black Indians need to be recognized. There was a whole controversy with the Cherokee and them not recognizing their black citizens. And that was very upsetting to me. We need to come together, not be separate. And welcome to the family. Aho, matakiyasu. I, I would like to add, uh, I'm so, I'm just so proud of you. You spoke well. And to also understand that right now I'm working with a coalition down in Thoroughfare, Virginia, where a brewery has just uprooted uh, about 130 African American and Native American graves. And it was done intentionally. And you can look that up, Thoroughfare Coalition. But because what had happened, I'm not from Virginia, but you are all my relations. And I'm five foot two and a half, but I stand tall because I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors. I am a Lenape citizen, but I am your sister. Okay? So with that being said, when you look at the way the land is, you will see the blood that was spilled on this land. You will not be able to separate the blood into any particular pigmentation or melanin or ethnicity. We as a people, and now you as our people, we are of the four directions and they are intertwined. They cannot be separated. There were white people who came here. They were indentured servants. Their blood was spilled because they were considered less 
Okay, there were, uh, there were other people. There were the Asians brought here, and I have one of my sisters who's Onondaga. Her brother decided to do his DNA, and he came back as Chinese, and they have the same mother and father. See, so you, you cannot um, acknowledge one group of people without giving credence and honor to all who, have, who sleep, who sleep under Reagan Airport, who sleep under that White House. We walk on them every day. So we are one. You are me, as I am Mike, as I am Ryan. So welcome, as Mike said, welcome to the family. Thank you all very much. Uh, Khabibi, you're, you are muted again. I was just saying that welcome is reciprocal because just as my family absorbed, I think we have, there's a history of, of protection and honor and, 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 you know, in the effort to have forward motion. So the welcome is received and the welcome is given. Thank you very much. Um, I see hands from Buddy and from Rico. Are they to this question or to others that you've seen in the chat? Not this question. To my example of here, the anime a plantation called uh, Adler, all culture. Buddy, we're having a lot of trouble hearing you. Um, I think there might be some connectivity issues there. Um, Rico, you had your hand up? Uh, yes. Um, you know, th this is a question that has come up very often, and there are as many interpretations as to how to answer it. Um, you, know, you, can, you can go with James Baldwin, you can go with Malcolm X, or, uh, you know, they, they all had different uh, ideas as to how to respond to, uh, to that. Um, I try to look at things in context. Um, I try to figure out, okay, what was going on in Africa after the, I think it was the Berlin Conference back in the 1880s when the European powers got together and decided that they were going to slice and dice the continent of Africa up uh, for themselves. Um, ultimately, it, it didn't work. And I think the worst culprit of all of that was the king of uh, Belgium, who I'm told um, is responsible for the loss of nearly somewhere more than 5 million people in the Congo, uh, just in and of itself. But then I look and, and see that they were bringing in people, they were calling them slaves, but they were bringing in uh, for South Africa, uh, people from uh, India uh, to be their laborers. They would not use the uh, indigenous Africans uh, for labor. So they brought in Asian Indians and there was a lot of turmoil there that the Asian Indians were pretty much in the same circumstances as post-slavery uh, in this country. And uh, in the night, late 1940s, Mahatma Gandhi went there to try to reconcile some of the things to get equality for the Asian Indians uh, in South Africa. And, uh, but that did not work out. As a matter of fact, Gandhi, I see your hand flying there. there you know, <laughs> I don't mind you disagreeing with me. But uh, there were things that happened in Africa being sliced and diced that are comparable to what was going on here. And that people outside of that continent being brought in uh, to do the work that the, the dominant culture did not want to do. Um, right now, uh, there's a exhibit, a traveling exhibit that's going around and might be one permanent at the uh, National Museum of the American Indians called uh, Black Indians that was uh, done by uh, Gabriel Tayak and others. Uh, and I, I would refer anybody to that to get some historical background on what was going on. But at the same time, you have to look at what was going on elsewhere uh, at the same time with some of the same uh, drama going on with other people. Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, I thought that was your hand going back and forth. That's a fan. You fooled me. <laughs> I thought you were trying to slap me. <laughs> Okay, that, that, that's, no, 
<laughs> but uh, you know, uh, something like this, that that relationship and the the context, when you look at what was going on on other continents in, involving indigenous people, those who you might call the colonials or invaders into those uh, countries, and the impact that they had, the similarities are profound, and it, it bears uh, looking at the comparisons. Thank you all so very much for this rich conversation. It is unfortunately two minutes past two, and as always, there's never enough time for these conversations. Many of you have asked questions about how to go about doing land acknowledgements or how to go about contacting tribal peoples. Um, you will see here a series of contact information for some of the tribes whose participants are joining us today. And I'd like to draw your attention to something that came up in our pre-webinar a conversation as we prepared for this. Of course, um, many tribal peoples have very small populations, especially in comparison with the large metropolises that are in Maryland, the greater DC area and the Baltimore area. Um, so that, of course, leads to reduced capacity. And so in addition to the contact information you see here, I'd like to draw your attention in the upper right hand corner to the uh, contact information for Administrator Keith Colston, who administers the Maryland Commission on Indian Affairs. This is a state of Maryland commission. And among many other things, the commission functions as a kind of a communicational clearinghouse with tribal peoples. So when in doubt, please direct your uh, communications through Keith to the tribe you're interested in getting in contact with. Uh, again, very quickly before we close, uh, many folks asked questions about how to go about doing land acknowledgements, and I'd like to draw your attention to the um, webinar that Maryland Traditions presented um, back in the fall. And I'll place the link for that into the chat right now. And please be aware that uh, both today's webinar will be going up on YouTube as a resource for you, and that Maryland State Arts Council will be publishing a very large amount of resources that came from our land acknowledgement project as public resources for you on our website. Um, Without further ado, if you have any desire to learn more about MSAC and its programs, and especially its funding streams, we are primarily a grant maker after all, you're welcome to sign up on tinyurl.com slash MSAC mailing list, and or check out our uh, website at msac.org and scroll to the bottom there. Thank you also very much for joining us, and thank you to our participants and audience members for a very rich conversation this afternoon. Yeah.